it's three minutes after half past eight. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the first masterclass which we are organizing during 24th edition of the Hlava International Documentary Film Festival. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, this year, the Hlava Festival is online, but it gives us a chance to meet people who might not travel to Czech Republic at these days. And I'm very happy that tonight we are meeting Roberto Minervini, the director. Uh, if we would now be sitting in cinema, imagine that the cinema would be completely full. People would not be sitting only on the seats, but all around in the cinema uh, and uh, clapping their hands, yeah, waving uh, ovations uh, for inviting you or welcoming you uh, at the Hlava Festival. So this we have to imagine now, but uh, yeah. I believe that this is happening at every place, at every computer. Our uh, visitors are watching us at the moment or will uh, after we finish and it will be accessible on our YouTube channel. So dear Roberto, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us. I am so happy we can talk together because I have to say that I am really fascinated by your way of filmmaking. And when I, thanks to this opportunity, had a chance to get deeper into your life and your opinions and, uh, let's say, uh, moments that uh, pushed you in your uh, career as a filmmaker, I even more like I'm fascinated and feel very close to you. Uh, actually, you are now in Houston, yeah? Uh, what's not a typical place uh, for American filmmakers, I would say. Uh, and it's pretty close to Ihlava's perspective because Ihlava is definitely uh, not the film center, uh, even not in the Czech Republic, not in Europe. But it's a place where every year thousands of people come and they're passionately watching uh, uh, films we select and these films are films which are maybe different compared to some other selections but are very direct, very risking, experimental, honest and I feel that you're on the right place. So uh, thank you for being here with us and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's too bad I can be there. Hopefully yeah. next year. <laughs> Please tell me, how is the situation now in Houston? Uh, because all of us mm -hmm. are going through this co Corona times. So how is the situation at your place? Well, we have a, we're dealing with two, a two faced monster here. One is the coronavirus. Uh, Houston had become the epicenter of coronavirus and, uh, uh, just a month ago. Um, we have a democratic government, local government, uh, reason why they enforce the use of masks, although there's been a lot of protests. And, uh, uh, so the situation is getting better. And then the other issue is the political, you know, uh, landscape with the upcoming elections for which, you know, being in Texas, there's a lot of uh, acrimony and tension between the two factions and uh, and there is a lot of, you know, the other day I went to the supermarket and you can already, you know, tell, you know, the divide and, uh, you know, people wearing uh, merchandise and apparel from one side or another. You can tell the tension that we are going through and this will last for a while. Great. Thank, thank you. And please stay safe uh, to this uh, concrete situation in States. We will come back during talking about your films. Uh, part of uh, our section at this year's Sihlava, we have a tribute to you, to Roberto Minervini, and we are screening three films, Low Tide from 2012, The Other Side from 2015, and the last one, What You Gonna Do When the World's on Fire from 2018. What's a uh, great title, I have to say. Uh, how did you come up to this title? Because it's really like if we should say if we sh somehow we should label the times we are going through this is the label we can use yeah it's a, it's a it's it's a gospel from the beginning of the 20th century and uh, uh being a fan of the of the uh, folk blues i uh, always appreciated the version that Le Belli, Le Belli did of this gospel um 
and I uh, was interested in the meaning of it. You know, the you know the answer to that question was running to I'm going to run to my Lord, and that's really the, all the lyrics of the uh, there are in, in the gospel. And it was uh, touching, interesting, shocking, uh, thought-inducing the fact that uh, running to the Lord meant two things, right? Running to God, so finding a hope that is transcendental, that is beyond our reach, in a way of terrestrial reach, or finding to, or running back to the slave owner, which is actually the, like the, uh, the best or the or the worst cases uh, going back to a situation that uh, although painful uh, was the only the only hope there was for some sort of salvation mm -hmm. so both both were not really an answer you know running to god uh, seeking refuge in god uh, uh, or, or seeking refuge to the slave owner where neither of them had, 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 were a clear answer uh, to an, to a, a very tangible pain so I thought, you know, no matter what the, the shape of the film will be, no matter what the direction it'll take, this will be the title. Yeah, a title with an, an answer question. It's interesting. I didn't know that it's from the beginning of 20th century. It's a gospel. Uh, so do you think that uh, it's, uh, no, it's obvious, it's uh, usual that the world is on fire whenever you think you live? It means that... I think uh, perhaps uh, oh, that's, uh, you know, uh, there's an argument to be made for that, especially if the world, we, we, if we want to adopt, a, you know, if, if we look at the world with a little bit of compassion and a sense of unity of, of oneness, then we could say that there's always fires and, and that affects all of us. The problem is that fire, the temperature is not the same for everyone, depends on where we are geographically, where we are in terms of uh, our race, ethnicity, uh, gender. Uh, uh, so um, like, like Judy from the last film was telling me, you know, it, it all depends, you know, it, um, if you, she was saying, if you're white, you know, you run and you, you, you'll be rescued. If you're black, you'll have to rescue yourself. So, or burn um, that kind of might sound uh, excessively emphatic, but it tells a, the, the truth of this world. There is, you know, depend on your situation, which we mostly inherit. Uh, we inherit it. Uh, sometimes we don't even. Many of us haven't fought hard for it. We just had the golden ticket. According to that, you know, the world seems like it's not on fire. But uh, you know, uh, that says a lot about the, the you know, how divided. We are, and uh, yeah. Please tell us at the beginning a uh, few words about uh, yourself, because you're originally coming from Italy, yeah, now living in the United States. So, what's your hometown in Italy? How would you describe it? I come from a small village called Uranus Mountain, Monte Urano, uh, in the Marches region, the Marche in Italian which is uh, on the East Coast in front of Croatia. Um, I'm from the southern part of that region, which is mostly working class. My hometown is completely working class, blue collar. We are part of the triangle of the shoe, shoe factories or shoemakers. That's, that's how they used to call it. Now in total decline, uh, uh, mostly, you know, it's, it's an area plagued by unemployment now. But I left when I was, I started, I left for the first time when I was 21, uh, and I never returned uh, from the age of 24 on, um, <clears throat> not even for a walk in town. Uh, Why? Just fully, Why? Because I, because uh, I strongly belonged to that, that, you know, I was a strong part of that community. That's all there was for me. Uh, I was not supposed to go to high school. I was supposed to go to work like everybody else and become a shoe worker at the age of 14. I, I lived, I witnessed, you know, the upturns and the economic upturns and downturns with all the, you know, exhilaration, the, the, the upturns brought and all the despair that the downturns brought. And in both cases, people resorted to, you know, gambling, drugs and other and other diversions uh, which which doomed the population i was i remember a lot of fear growing up 
in those environments. And I, and I thought I wasn't going to make it. I thought I wasn't going to be able to leave town. I had this dream of going to a city. For me, Milan was, I don't know, Mars. Uh, I'd never been. Uh, so I saw maybe a one day I'll land in a big town. So and as soon as I did at one time, I actually was in Milan. I skipped Milan and went to London. And I never looked back. And I was terrified of the fact that if I look back, if I did what I did every single day of my life, which is go around, you know, the main town square, stop at the bar where I spent every afternoon of my life from the age of three to the age of 21, hang out with my friends, and then I might get attached to it again, and then I might never leave again. So I made this... Uh, instinctive yet drastic uh, decision to just never show up again and the first time i did was for screening of my film in 2016 mm -hmm. so uh after about 25 years yeah that was the first time many of your uh, characters in films you shot uh, feel anger uh, and it's not anger in terms of uh, fighting with somebody, but it's anger against uh, conditions they live in. Uh, did you feel this anger being uh, or living in, in this southern Italy? I did. Uh, I did because uh, anger is, uh, you know, is, is the counterpoint of fear. You know, when there's... Uh, even when there's fear, there's anger, you know, it's, it's an antidote of it, or as a product of fear. Uh, in my case, it's the latter. It is as a product of fear. So I reacted to the fear, the fear of, of not being able to make it, whatever that means. You know, it means many things not to be able to make it. Uh, as I said, for me, it means to make it, you know, beyond what was written, the path that was written for me. Uh, to make it just, uh, you know, to have a happy life and some, some sort of happiness. And um, uh, so, so, yeah, I reacted with a lot of anger. And I just, that's why I look for, uh, I look for, you know, harsh, hasty breakups. Uh, always never looking back. I found strength in anger. And uh, never looking back, uh, um you know, never taking any written and unwritten rule for granted just because, you know, never sub submitting to authority just because they told me to. So I have become perhaps some sort of a rebel in that sense. But, you know, my rebellious uh, persona was definitely moved by a, a lot of fear, which manifested in the, sh in the form of anger several times in my life. And then some year has passed and you moved to New York yeah, as an IT consultant from blue collar society to white collar society, uh, having uh, this American dream with a uh, good job and, uh, you know, living in the center around Manhattan. Uh, but this dream didn't last uh, for long. Uh, no, there's a lot of there's a lot of steps in, in between. Uh, I moved. I, I went to London. It's not really going from blue collar to to white collar, but I wanted to be. I wanted to quit college, become a waiter in London. I experienced freedom in London, um, and then I got arrested in London. Uh, I thought this ah, this is it. For this what? Is it. No, for just for just you know petty petty. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> think. Silly. I mean, I don't know if it's silly. It's silly. Just getting to the restaurant, eating, then you know, refusing to pay, running away from the police and stuff like that. But it's not. A, I, I felt, you know, um, yeah, I felt. I don't know. I was uh, experienced again, as I said, rule abiding versus rule breaking, and the consequences of it is all experiential for me, and it was it was formative. It was it was interesting to. You know, to hear and to feel, you know, they, they, they you know, be handcuffed and all that. So, um, all I'm, and it being it, it, the experiential aspect of living and making films is a big late motive for me. So, I'm sure we'll talk about, I'll repeat this word experiential again. But after London, then I decided to move to Madrid. I finished college while I was living in Madrid. I ended up in the music scene, I was a punk rock singer for a long time. And uh, while, you know, in the, you know, in, in the darkness of the night, in the Spanish night, uh, the, you know, infused with music and, and parties, I met this girl and she happened to be American and I did not hesitate to follow her to America. And 
and then I married her and now we have two kids together and it's been 23 years. So uh, I didn't really mean to, to become a white collar guy. Uh, but it, the thing is, if I wanted to be with this woman, I really needed to step up my game. And uh, in order to find a job in America, I got enrolled in an MBA. I got a master's in business administration. I finally found a job in New York. But then so for law, 9 11, yeah, but then 9 11, then 9 11 happened. Uh, I had customers, we had clients uh, for the, in, the, in, the, in the Twin Towers. Uh, we were deployed on a project working with a company called eSpeed and uh, about 220 employees. They started seven in the morning every day. So that day I, I just checked, and that, that I checked uh, the internet and the website was already off. So I, I never inquired again. I'm, I don't think, I'm, I'm sure it didn't end up well for all of them. Uh, well, that's rhetorical, obviously they all died. And uh, so a lot of us, thousands of us, were laid off. And they were because the office was in the World Trade Center, yeah? Uh, no, the office was in Midtown on 55th Street. But a lot of us, our clients, we were work on projects. Uh, we were consultants, so we were work on projects everywhere. And our clients were in the Twin Towers. Uh -huh. But we would rarely go, at least my team would rarely go there. Uh -huh. uh, also, we started at 8.30, so, um, you know, we, we avoided the issue. Um, But uh, so we got laid off and we got compensated as victim of September 11 because uh, we lost our jobs because of because of September 11. So with the money, with the money, which is 18 months of full salary, I actually was able to afford, you know, uh, paying for a master in media studies. And that's how it all started. So that's how you got closer to cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Although I would have to take a step back before. Going to New York as an IT consultant, I had already enrolled for the same company in Rome, thinking that I would move to America and be with my, to be with my girlfriend. And uh, being, being uh, cosmically frustrated with that uh, empty job, which meant nothing but a paycheck for me, and being utterly... Uh, unable to abide by, uh, by, you know, subject myself to the authority or the, the rigid hierarchical structure. So becoming so insubordinate and becoming so inefficient as a worker. And I think they were happy to get rid of me and send me to America. Um, so I started, I started studying cinema at night uh, with, a, with a Ukrainian filmmaker called Leonid Alexeychuk with his wife Larissa. They lived in Rome. And I started, you know, I became friends and I learned a lot from him, a lot to learn from, from him. And, and the biggest lesson, he, he was, uh, he had a lot of lessons, but I remember when he said that he did what he did because when he died, he wanted in mean, his tomb to be, you know, to read, uh, at least I tried. And he always said, I failed and I struggled, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to try. Then I remember thinking, you know, maybe, yeah, one day I'll, I'll try to. I would perhaps I was already trying at the time. And do you remember uh, what was so fascinating for you at that moment on making films? Why you wanted to be a filmmaker? I didn't because know. I, I read one sentence you said I really like that you make films because you care about things, and this is the way how you can uh, somehow describe the problems or say something to the problems but what was the first fascination you know like uh... yeah it's true i mean the first really i mean uh, for me to to approach to have this relationship with leonid was was crucial because leonid like many of the ex-ussr filmmakers they risked their life for you know in order to make a film and in order to to speak their vo to, to 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 speak their mind they risk imprisonment and there is uh, death and and Leone that to you know, ran away and escaped to Canada and uh, and you know the the, the the martyrdom of the of the, of the artist you know risks it's his or her life to you know in the name of something that is bigger than than the life itself so it's it's an act of selflessness it's an act of militancy to, you know, in defense of people, really, you know, you are doing this for posterity, you're doing it for people, you're not doing it for yourself. And I think that that was, that was, uh, it wasn't charming or fascinating. 
it was um, it was um, empowering. It was empowering. It was, it was that was that was a true militancy, the grassroots militancy of the artist. So a filmmaker thought could do that. Uh, little did I know that then you know if you shoot a film with your digital portable digital camera, and then you know they had to deal with the with the uh, this uh, bourgeois vision of cinema that perhaps festivals have where, you know, we're talking about statics and form in a, such a Western European way for which you then have an entry barrier. The doors are not open just because you are, because you're, you're a militant filmmaker. You have to abide by certain rules that please the eye and the taste and the taste buds of the, of the most refined and sophisticated personalities that populate our, the world of cinema. So little did I know that I was going to have to do another, you know, roll up on sleeves and fight on my own battles. But at that time, I found empowering. I said, this is why I want to choose a, a visual medium, because I want to be a carrier of other people's messages. Because in the end, uh, I don't have much to say, except be the intermediary for people who have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. uh... Thank you. Uh, I think this is the good time to see the extract uh, from the film Low Tide. Uh, we will present all three films through short extracts and then uh, we can follow uh, talking about this film and your film method. Uh, uh, the main character of this film is a boy who has no name in the film. It's interesting that we don't hear his name. Uh, why did you decide not to uh, name him? Because um, because before uh, telling that story and getting to know Daniel and his family, Daniel is the real name of the boy. Um, I have met many boys like that, you know, as I said, from childhood and 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 uh, and uh, through adulthood. And perhaps, like my dad said when he first saw the film, he asked me if uh, that he had, he saw a little bit of me and. Uh, and and he, uh, yeah, and he could tell that there's a somewhat autobiographical. I mean, lived, grew up in Italy in the seventies, a highly politicized family, where uh, again um, people were against the system, anti-establishment. And then a kid that felt really scared in that environment at times. And I feel, I I felt like an afterthought. Sometimes I thought this political mission and this political fight sometimes is bigger than than my than me. And, uh, and so there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of that in the film. Thank you. So please, if you can watch now, then extract. Thank you.
Mom? Hey. How's it going? How was your summer? Pretty good. All right. Yep. So. Hey, Vernon. What's up? Uh, should we go look for the camps? Yeah. Okay, let's go. So we are back. Uh, we have seen extract from the film Low Tide, which I have chosen. It's from, let's say, one third of the film. And I think all important aspects, uh, all important uh, figures, motives are included in this eight minutes. Uh, it's the main character, his mother, which is mostly missing in his life, uh, animals as a strong um, I would say metaphor uh, of uh, living in a place where there is no space for love. The only connection uh, are with animals. But uh, it's also very strong. We feel very connected uh, to all figures. So please, uh, Roberto, tell us, why did you decide it to uh, make this film? Why did you want it to show this um, perspective of American society, which is very far away from perspective of American cinema we know from Hollywood studios? Yeah, upon moving to Texas, I, I became very good friends with uh, a man called 
Min Jin Kelton, who's uh, featured in my first film, The Passage. And Min Jin was a blues man uh, belonging to the biker blues uh, scene, which is, you know, in, in the in the in the imaginarium of people, the biker blues is where they, you you play behind uh, uh, behind um, uh, uh, not a fence. What's the name of it? Where they throw beer at you and you play behind a curtain of of, of metal, so to protect you, you know, in bars and dive bars. And uh -huh. so he was he was that man. He, he was you know he, he dressed up as Mean Gene, and and then he was Gene me, and and he was uh, and through him I got to know. You know the outskirts. You know went well beyond you know the the the, the city limits of Houston, which is uh, it might look like a, a fairly normal, you know, fairly average average U.S. city or southern U.S. city, but uh, the outskirts are very different, and that's where I spend most of my time with Gene. Um, and through Gene, I got to know a lot of people and families. Hung out with all these people, like like the uh, Blanchard family, with featured in the film in Low Tide. And I realized, you know, several, I, I, draw, I drew some parallelisms with my own, you know, upbringing, right? People are overworked. And when they're overworked, they, kids are to toughen up, suck it up, toughen up, and, you know, uh, take care of themselves most of the time. So this film, um, um, again, it's not about the, the pity, or, you know, this pitiful image of a boy who's alone. It's actually more about, uh, his way of coping with the absence, inevitable, the inevitability uh, of a condition, which is the absence of parents, uh, you know, in this case, a broken family, like, like many other families, uh, with overworked, uh, an overworked parent who then has to find, again, solace in, uh, yeah, has to numb out and check out with friends and get drunk. And this is something I've seen many times, uh, not understanding why people were falling asleep while standing in my house. Uh, that was during the heroin epidemic. Where I literally, I didn't know. I thought people were really tired. Uh, or you know, again, you know, in the you know the parties and all that. So, um, and that's why I chose. You know, I, I got very close with the family, and uh, I chose to represent, tell a story that you know they hit home for me for them and uh, and that's how the story the story started you know with the outline uh, that i had written and then uh, that became uh, the starting point for us to you know go and 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 create scenes and improvise scenes and at time observe some scenes uh, that was kind of a precursor of my precursor of my method which is more observational it's, it's become more observational in the case it was uh, more, uh, there was more of the reenactment. That's what we, how we call it. But that for me means kind of creating the conditions so that we can, uh, you know, we can allow for some situation to emerge, although we facilitate it. So for me, that reenactment is facilitation of, of, a, of a situation that has to contain some truth. Uh, so that's, that's how it all started. And, um, and that's how the, the story that I came around, you know, the story. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, these three films we are screening in Ihlava, it's uh, somehow illustrating your way uh, your, uh, from fiction, which looks like documentary, to documentary, which looks like fiction, uh, So, which is the last one. Uh, we will come uh, later to uh, this film, but uh, this film is pretty fictional. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. we we could feel the Darden brothers or Ken Loach style of filming, uh, but uh, it's also very fragile. It's incredibly well acted. Uh, we don't feel that there is a camera, but also we don't feel uh, it's. Uh, it is acted. I always was like frightening <laughs> if it's real or not, because some scenes are pretty tough. Uh, so I would like to ask, how did you manage to do this? Uh, how long did you shoot it? How did you uh, choose these actors? And are they related? Is it uh, mother mm -hmm. and son or they are acting this mother and son relationship? Yeah, so the film is... Uh... It's fictional, especially because from the beginning I chose, I, I knew that I wanted a sense of linearity 
the film follows and the linearity follows a chronology. So all of those elements are very, very, uh, uh, you know, predominant in, 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 in fiction, in fiction filmmaking. Uh, and yet the film, you know, there's several moments that are completely, uh, some of them, a few of them are observed, but others, they just come from the characters. Uh, the party, we didn't see, but there was a scene of debauchery, the, the, the you know, and that's being created, you know, putting together a party where people, people just partied and, and cer certainly didn't want to leave after the shoot was over. So there was, I was understanding that by using the tool of fiction, I could actually uh, trigger I could use as a trigger for something real to happen or something cathartic to happen. And then if you read and interpret and are present during the catharsis, then you can use that as a trigger for something subsequent. Uh, and, and that's how I started feeling that uh, perhaps fiction could be just, uh, just a trigger, that's just, the, um, just a spark. And that's how then my method evolved. Um, as far as the characters go, um, the boy and the mother are actually uh, siblings. Uh -huh. The boy, the, 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 the story of the mother is very pertinent to the real mother of the two. But there was, uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, the mother's a different, a changed person, and it was too painful to go through to that uh, again. But as a matter of fact, why did I choose, or did we together choose the, the sister? Because she's the one who actually experienced a lot of what the boy did not experience as a daughter. She's the one who lived through, in her case, it's the 80s, uh, through, you know, having, you know, to live, with, deal with alcoholism and all that, you know, the, 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 the dysfunctional uh, aspects of, uh, you know, of, of family life. And, uh, and so for her, that was the catharsis. For her, it was uh, it was uh, it was very you know uh, painful and, and and deep and extremely hard to to actually be the one who now carried you know who transfer kind of the experience through to to, to her her own little little brother and um, for me it was important even more important to keep the oral fiction, the fictional aura throughout the shoot, just because I needed to protect Daniel. Daniel is the boy. I needed to, you know, I needed to reassure him that this wasn't going to, whatever we did or whatever happened in this filmic world that we were creating, wasn't going to have repercussion in his life. It's not something that I, that I explained. It's something that, you know, it's, it's a way of, I nurtured him to the point that he felt safe enough and knowing that this was in the end something that was self-contained. And that for me is that safety that I need to create, that safe space where people, that people feel that they can be who they are without consequences. And that's something that I do in documentary too. That hasn't changed. So for me, working on fiction was actually a kind of a fairly, uh, uh, safe and smooth way to actually ease into the work of, of a relational documentary where I put where I invest not days, not months, but years and, and uh, into, you know, the life of people. Mm -hmm. And why you wanted to create so violent scenes in the film? There are not so many, but there are a few which are pretty violent. Uh, um, what you wanted to describe is it emotion so, or is it experience? So there is, uh, this is, uh, again, it's, uh, this film is also represents an encounter between two cultures, right? Me, which is kind of in that I exemplify, you know, European, um, European culture. So a way of seeing things, a way of interpreting violence or brutality or rawness. And then there is this Southern, uh, the culture of the American South. Uh, um, the relationship with animals is one perhaps induces, you know, sometimes can be seen as, as violent at times, ruthless. Uh, uh, there are, you know, we are in a slaughterhouse in the film where cows are killed and we are fishing and the boy reacts, you know, uh, deals in a certain way with the fish, you know, stabs a fish and and then there is a situation where humans interact very differently. The rawness and the, the 
the physicality of the relationship is very present in a time when they when they serve beer to the boy, they force him to drink beer and uh, and some of them, um, the, the, the relationship with the animals, with the environment is something that does not belong to me. So there is, despite the fact that the, fix, the film is inherent and fictional, their relationship, those traits of the relationship uh, uh, with the animals don't belong to my world, my world. And the boy, the boy introduced me to all that. The boy introduced me to that. Um, kind of sometimes the inevitability or this kind of... Uh, 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 the power struggle between humans and animals. You mm -hmm. kill, you eat, uh, you know, and uh, there was something very spiritual or religious about it. I mean, they're not going to have, you know, a fish <laughs> doesn't go to heaven. <laughs> uh, that is also the religious culture is not something that, that pertains to me either. So there is that. And then there is... Uh, this physicality in the relationship, especially among men, among men, what it means to be a man. And a man is uh, the, the physical language of being a man, the physical language of being strong. Uh, that is something that I also struggle with and something that I also am afraid of because it's something that belongs to my upbringing. So a scene like the party that we haven't seen today, but I've described, you know, it comes from my own experience, my own memory of being, you know, being, as I said, being an afterthought or sometimes a mascot and being treated with excessive force or with excessive, uh, you know, with some sort of brute force or uh, definitely scary behaviors that I witnessed. So, so uh, I had this two dual, dual aspects in me. Uh, sometimes they're very conflictive and they try to coexist like, like in a bipartisan uh, you know, government, uh, but sometimes one takes over and rules the other one. But this is, uh, you know, uh, to be a man also, uh, you know, I, I want to detach from the, the all these uh, preconceived ideas of what it means to be a man. But then sometimes when I interact with a man and, and, and man means, you know, and the, the idea of strength and, 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 and then I sometimes, that part of me also comes out. And... Uh, so there is that conflict. The, 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 the violence in the film also represents this kind of dual, the, the internal conflict that I also have, which is, uh, which is uh, yeah, which is uh, uncomfortable, which is very uncomfortable about, you know, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a strong man in, in, a, in a society. Also in nudity, we saw just partly in the extract, uh, is uh, part of the film, not only of low tide, but also the other side. Uh, you show it in very national way, but it's surprising that there is so much nudity in both films. Uh, uh, why? What because that is... Yeah, you know, that is nudity and nudity and the physical prowess, you know, nudity, nudity is obviously one of the, it's a challenge to taboos, it's a challenge to taboos, it's also that feeds into the, uh, that it, uh, feeds into the, the desire of humans and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a desire that must mostly stay hidden and stays hidden, it's almost like... <laughs> Sometimes I think several of the societies, or at least the ones I experienced, they seem to abide by some Victorian uh, ideas of, of, of sex and nudity, which is still, uh, which is still very, very sinful, very, very ugly and very uh, taboo. And in these cases, in this environment, I find that a lot of the, a lot of the sense of irreverence comes through the body through the body, body language. And uh, there has been several instances in my life where people have challenged, I challenged my own beliefs through just, uh, through the naked body, through the, the naked sensual, the naked strong body. And it happens in um, the scenes that we see as spontaneous. There, is, there has been moments which like you mentioned the nudity in the other side, in uh, low tide, which is actually, it's a party where people do drugs and drink and uh, similarly in the other side there are situations where there's drugs and people make love uh, get naked and, and make love so in both instances when there is a, a situation that is inherently powerful explosive uh, what I 
what I've observed is that there's always someone who emerges and challenges or contributes to this explosiveness through this power of the body, uh, nudity and sexuality. And, um, and uh, interestingly, there's something that really disarms a lot of other people because, uh, because uh, I shot some of the scenes naked and it was a challenge. It was a challenge for me to, to accept the, you know, uh, the duel. I mean, to be confronted through, through the, you know, the, <clears throat> through the, you know, the, the vulnerability of the, of the body, really, which kind of says a lot about <clears throat> how strong you are. Well, however you want to interpret that, uh, it says a lot about it. Uh, there's a lot of signifiers there, you know, that, that mean a lot in, 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 a social, in a particular social context. So hence the importance for me to, uh, to depict uh, the nudity they always presented you unfolded before my eyes yeah, yeah, yeah i wanted to follow on this because uh, we can slightly move from low tide to the other side because this is aspect which connects both films in a way uh, the other side from 2015 is not shot in texas in louisiana and it has two main layers like uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, Again, like people living outskirts, drug dealers, uh, uh, poor people, criminals. And then there is this uh, second layer, and we will have later on the excerpt from the last scene from the film, where people are part of this, uh, of this paramilitary unit, uh, the other side. But uh, let's stop first on this first part of uh, the film, which is, again, very physical very emotional and uh, full of uh, this uh, nudity, sex, uh, uh, interaction between people uh, with not clear uh, relationships. I would say that we are living in community and uh, we are part of them. We are observing, but from inside, not from outside, what's very powerful. But uh, you mentioned somewhere that it was really like a physical experience for you and uh, that you somehow followed the nudity during the shooting, that it was like some kind of tension which was created between characters before the camera and the crew behind the camera. So can you tell us more about your method you use during shooting this kind of scenes or how you create the connection. You know, this is uh, the, the first part of the film, which is, yeah, cor you said it correctly, shot in Northern Louisiana. You know, the one of the first moments where I, I got to know some of the people I didn't know previously, I was immediately challenged to a fist fight. Immediately somebody brandished his fists and, and told me, Yo, before you even tell me who you are, let's get down to business. You know, I'm ready for you. I'm ready to fight. And I uh, remember just uh, saying that I wasn't going to do that because it was, I was going to lose because it was going to I was too scared. I wasn't there. For, you know, I, I, I acknowledge the strength. I don't have the same anger. I'm, therefore, I'm going to be beaten up. And I say, what I, mean, I fight in a different way here. You know, I'm, I, my, you know the, the raw power is, in, is what I, the stories I want to tell. You know, instead of fighting me, uh let's let's use what i had to offer uh you know to, for some sort of fight and we had to define what fight what battle we want to fight mm -hmm. this is just uh, to say that the that physicality again the phys the, the hierarchy of physical prowess of physical power which find we find in again violence so uh or we find in sexuality um was already in front of me but i knew i knew what to expect already um and I, uh, I approach the way I said, and I am very open and honest and transparent about uh, giving feedback, immediate feedback to a situation that I'm living. In that case, I was in, in order to do that, I need to stay focused into what I just said before, holding that space for people to feel, you know, free to be who they are without being judged, without feeling in danger. So somebody... When I notice that the man with two fists like this who challenges me, 
I'm just trying to, I'm not there for myself to preserve or defend my dignity of a man amongst men and accept a challenge. I'm there to say, you know, here, this is who you are. I hear you, man. I hear you. The fact that you're going to beat me up or not doesn't make any difference with what the reason with the fact that I'm here to offer you a platform. And, and so, and the, by the way, that was with an older man. It wasn't with, my, with the main character, with the main, the, the man or the couple in the first part. Uh, and um, so that's how, that's how I approach the situations. I go there to say that, you know, I, I accept the consequences of everything, you know, receiving you know, a blow in the face, a couple of punches in the face and being knocked out doesn't interfere with my process, doesn't change things. You know, as soon as I'll be able to stand up, I'm just going to hold that space. I made a choice. I made a commitment. I'm there to tell a story. And I know that there are dynamics that might hurt even physically. Uh, I know that there are things that I might disagree. I know there are moments where I don't want to be there, but the commitment, I commit not only to the people of the film, but I commit to the fact that I am holding a space for them. This is who I am as a filmmaker. I'm the holder of a sacred space, which becomes then the filmic realm for them to be who they are. That is really almost, uh, almost spiritual, but there is a spiritual component to it. Because this is really uh, in the realm of possibilities, or my possibilities, even more than, and I couldn't care less about my interpretation of what I see, my ju again, my judgment, as I say, or my, whether I'm, there is affinity or contrast between me and, and the characters and their reality. That is, not, that is an interference, that's pollution. It's pollution, it's polluting what I'm trying to do, and it's polluting truth. That is truth that I'm trying to depict. So that's how I was able to 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 make to to depict those scenes that I was able to get emerge, you know, be fully immersed in their reality. And um, because that act for me as an act of service, uh, and we talked about it in the introduction to this masterclass. Because in the end, um, I'm well aware of the fact that I take filmmaking very seriously. I'm very well the fact that whatever I release out there in the ether through festivals and then through uh, film distributors, it will outlive me. It's a testament of something that I did. And I don't, it, it, it's not, this is not an exercise of style. This is not chasing trophies and prices so, or, and free plane tickets. There's nothing to do with it. This is about me having the huge responsibility to carry you know, skits or chunks of life of people have opened the doors to me. And uh, in no way, shape or form will I be an obstacle to them or be entitled to judgment. Or, mm -hmm. And uh, so I am there. What, uh, what I appreciate very much uh, and what's not so often in contemporary cinema is that your films are also political. Uh, and it's not political in terms of, you know, I'm for Obama or I'm against Obama, but that you go deeper in the feelings of society where this political statement uh, comes from. So I would like to ask my colleagues from technical department to show us the second excerpt from the other side, and then we can talk about this political dimension of your film. First man is gonna start from your left. Have in mind, I'm looking at y'all, so on your left. Okay, starts. Move to the barricade. Second man's all the way on the right. Move to the far barricade. Squad leader is in the middle. He's gonna be the last one to move. He moves right here. From there, same sequence. Left, right, center. Move to the center barricade and cover. Communicate, use your hand signals. No words. going to be another revolution in this country. They can only step on our Constitution so much. 
I'm not saying that I want to be on the front line and getting into this, but it's coming, guys. I mean, it, it's going to happen eventually, and they're just putting more and more <clears throat> things into place so that it's right there in front of us, and we, we're not noticing it. No bullshit, within the next couple of months, the UN will be here. And that is all over Fox News, that's all over MSNBC, and we know they're owned by fucking Obama and them. They are coming. They've declared that the whole refugee thing and la la la, and they're gonna come down here and take care of them and figure out what's best for them. So that is the UN's door. So if you think that martial law is not coming eventually, wake up, because it will be coming. You know, the key thing right there, the second that they put in martial law into effect is when the shit's hitting the fan. It's gone too far. That's when they're gonna start kicking doors. That's when they're gonna do whatever they wanna do because you're just a pawn on a big old chessboard. Shut and down that, freeways. And the shut down freeways, checkpoints, everything else. So that's gonna be what's gonna spark our rendezvous. When I tell you grab your wife, your kids, whatever you're gonna need, you're not, most likely you will not go back to your house because if you do go back to your house, everything will be gone. Yeah. Everything, There's and I mean that. There's too many roadblocks and everything else to even get there. Highways will be shut down. That's what I mean by they're taking away more and more freedoms and trying to find stiffer punishment for shit that doesn't make no sense. But yet, you can murder somebody and get out in six years. You know, but, you know, go deal some drugs. Your ass will be there for fucking 20. Yep. Yep. And that's what I mean by, dude, it's just, you need to be prepared, guys. And yep. we're not out here just playing Boy Scouts, playing in the Army. We're out here preparing for the worst scenario. I mean, Take that's every, something I need everybody to be clear on. Every drills need to take seriously. I mean, because... How mean, you practice is how you yeah, perform. Yeah, exactly. But it's just something we got to think about, guys. Um, I do appreciate all y'all coming out today. I know we've been out here for a while, and it was a lot of running around. Uh, next time, it'll be something new. It'll be something else that we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be doing it actually every two weeks is what we're going to be meeting from here on out. He's going to have to skim the ground. Down there, lower. Just land the motherfucker. We like doing like 20 to 30 mile an hour. That's duct tape. Man, that looks badass right there. Yeah, like right now, he's heading straight in that wind. That, uh -huh. man, whenever we got to fly, dude, it was fucking insane how much that wind fucking played on him. I just want to fly in it, that's it. Did you give him a beer? Did you give him beer? There you go. <laughs> oh yeah, we got this. No, this blood is getting small. No, yeah, yeah I should have put blood. Oh, my sucks. I got an AR. That's all I'm I, I got a scope your, on this. Yeah. I got a scope on this. Yeah, AR. Well, we'll yeah, just yeah, set up yeah. one big tart, one big one. And then one big one. We'll just everybody set up because we can't one, set up two, three of them if we ain't got three good guns. Let's go ahead and step step back and uh. We'll just go ahead and blow a shitload of holes in it, and then we'll, we'll yeah. blow it the fuck up. <clears throat> oh, man. Oh, you gonna go ahead and blow one of them up? Who else ready? Who's ready? Oh, let's go. Stay <laughs> with. Say what we think about it. Almost went in the truck. The whole speaker. Hey, let me see. Fuel the fire. Hey, yo. That's all I do. That game. 
twist metal. Reminds me of Grand Theft Auto. Woo! Oh, fucking fun. America! I mean. <laughs> So we have seen the last scene of the film, The Other Side, uh, which is actually uh, visionary because it was shot in 2014, I suppose, two years before Trump was elected. And uh, for many critics, it was a big surprise showing this in film. Uh, it's a great scene, a little bit ironical, maybe, but uh, I would like to ask if if you created the scene, if it was your idea or if it's ob observation, if uh, it happened naturally? Yeah, I mean, it happened, uh, uh, the, shoot, the shoot was over. It was the, it was the first day after the shoot, which was my birthday. Usually the sh my, all my film shoots and either on my birthday or the day before my birthday so that we can all, uh, uh, since it happens in the summer, so we can all celebrate together. And uh, uh, my director of photography wasn't even there anymore. Uh, I went there because they the, the guys there, they had a cake for me and had a surprise for me. So uh, the surprise was the car. So at first I wanted to enjoy the show, the surprise, and uh, uh, the, the assistant camera went to the car without, uh, without me requesting uh, for the camera and br brought it back. Uh, the sound guy was still there, brought, you know, sound equipment. So they asked me, they told me, where we go, and we go ahead and film it. So I did. So it's me. I grabbed the camera and filmed my surprise, my birthday gift, without knowing what it was going to be. So um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I was just chuckling now watching it because when the sniper shoots, so the, the, blows up the car uh, because of the, the Tannerite, the explosive in the car, uh, I, 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 you know, I have this jerky movement with the camera because I was, I almost fell because of the, of the explosion. And there is a tail end to that story, which is police showed up. Obviously, the explosion was massive, and then, and then when the police and it's on camera actually, but uh, when the police showed up, I said, "What, what are you doing?" And they said, "We're blowing up Obama." And then the, the cops say, "Okay, well then, keep doing what you're doing." And that's fine. Then that's a great thing. So, um, so definitely that is uh, that is part of this, you know, uh, uh, observation. But it's not just observation. It's the fact that you know, as we as we spend a lot of time together, uh, we turn on the camera when everybody's comfortable, and uh, and uh, sometimes the ideas don't even start from me. In this case, if it was for me, I wouldn't have shot this film, this scene. And that it happens so many, you know, very frequently throughout the shoot. So I don't go there just with the idea of shooting. I'm, I go, I, you know, I spend every day with the idea of experiencing and observing and enjoying. And then at times, uh, which is the minority of the times, we, we you know, uh, we shoot. And uh, so that that's one scene. That's that's one a big example there that the film was not supposed to end like that. It just happened with like that. My Last three films, which are mainly considered documentaries, I mean, they they kind of check check all the you know a lot of the, all the a lot of the boxes for documentary filmmaking. Uh, I'm not a box checker. I don't really like all this, but I understand why these. And I guess all of, the three of them end with the scene that is uh, that is just uh, that happened. That happened. Uh, you know, they, they surprised me. All this, the three is uh, the last scenes of this. The, my last three films were not supposed to be there. They just happened, and uh, and I and I just happened to to film them. So um, as I was saying before, my uh, my cinema is experiential. And it is experience, experience informs what I know about people and places and my, my cultural background. Uh, experience informs my film and also experience, experience informs my friendships and my relationships. Mm -hmm. I, 
yeah, great relationships with the, the, the paramilitary group because of the fact that from a human standpoint, their experience is something that I could relate. Feeling of the abandonment, institutional abandonment, the fear that informs the anger, the fear of losing it all, uh, the fear of not making it, uh, not being able to provide the family, protecting the family, protecting the family. Uh, I, I hear all that. And I do, I, 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 I understand that. And then there is, obviously, there is a cultural, cultural uh, you know, the, enormous cultural differences for which, you know, uh, fear and anger, then they manifest in a different way. It can be politicized or less politicized. It can be brutal force, brute force or not. In this case, there is a lot about going back to some values, you know, embracing, you know, uh, you loading your, your weapons and, and protecting, risking your life to protect your family. There, there is, it's, it's very peculiar of a certain culture, which is not my culture. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, were you surprised how people reacted on this, watching this scene or even the whole film? Uh, the critics, uh, I, I, you are following the characters, but for example, in some critics, uh, I didn't have this feeling. Uh, I still felt that there is a gap between these critics writing the reviews and the life of your characters, you know, they're using these words like droggy and yeah. it's, 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 dehumanizing it's, it's, a little bit. But that's the thing. That's, uh, and uh, the, 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 I deeply, uh, I have, I don't have the least bit of respect and I deeply, I have spite for the presumptuous, pedantic, uh, academic, uh, so uh, po uh, attitude of people pontificate over things they have not the, be, the, not the least clue about. There is a uh, very few people who are competent enough to to talk about the uh, right wing militia in America. I've read articles that came three years after I shot this film about. And it's usually the guard, the Guardian, some outlets who are really, they still do investigative, investigative journalism. They talked about the militia, the meaning of the militia, not only historically, but this lingering effects of having used militia in wars in America. There is something that a film critic knows very little about, except for, but, you know, they wouldn't agree with me because they are, most of the people are well read. But from an experiential standpoint, standpoint that knowledge is it's, it probably equals zero and i don't res i don't have a particular respect when people uh feel that they're entitled to again uh, to um uh to 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 uh to to judge a situation in a binary way in terms of right or wrong without even the awareness of being so referential and putting a culture which is at, at times, you know, in, 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 in Eurocentric intellectually, it happens a lot with them. Um, that is, and but it, all they do is is, is uh, uh, reinforce that supremacy, the cultural supremacy over another culture, which is inherently catastrophic as an approach. So of course I expected it, but uh, I'm usually uh, I'm not. I'm not interested in it. I'm much more interested in the feedback from the community. Uh, the community in Cannes, just to give you an example, in Cannes, the film was received very well um, during, during the screening. So there was this applause, which uh, resembles a standing ovation in terms of duration and, 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 and the, the vigor of, of, the, of, the, of the clapping uh, <laughs> activity. And then one of the paramilitaries come downstairs. You know, they were they were sitting, uh, you know, a few rows behind me. One comes, you know, comes to me with a bullet shell, you know, on on his hat, and hugs me and say, "You did a great job. This is a great film. I thank you. This is an amazing thing." And he hugs me very warmly, in gratitude, and I could see the faces of those who are clapping, saying, "Like, who the hell are we?" Who are we cheering for here? What are we celebrating? Are we celebrating a right wing Malay? So the concerns were other concerns that that concerns that they're uh, only about themselves. It's a, a self centeredness of a thought 
that is all about the preservation of a culture, of a species, the supremacy of it. So I, 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 uh, I, uh, uh, I dissent completely from that kind of criticism, and I don't think, it, again, um, uh, experience is what matters, and uh, I don't have, again, I am not the one pontificating about anything. I am the one, you know, sharing an experience that sometimes lasts months, many times last years, but I'm not an expert of anything. But uh, um, I just, uh, I wish that people would not elevate themselves to the status of experts. But again, there's no bitterness in it because there's not even respect. I don't have any, I don't have any respect for that kind of criticism. I like your subversivity when you bring your characters, your protagonists to A film festivals, yeah, like Cannes and Venice and Toronto. It, it, it's really great. But talking about these uh, paramilitary, paramilitary uh, groups, uh, we read today in newspapers that there is big tension around the presidential elections in US and that this might be a danger. Do you feel it the same way that uh, this is really like... Uh, um, danger situation. Yeah, it is. People, uh, I, as I was looking the scene, you know, as I was, uh, as I said, I was connecting a very primordial way with them, right? The fear, therefore, the anger, the need to protect, uh, the being uh, invisible at times, feeling that they are being unheard and they're being invisible. Um, I, I totally get it. Then, how that feeling evolves into a thought, well, in the middle, there is a lot of, you know, got, where we gather our information. So in that case, all well, the conspiracy theory is today mainstream. In f six years ago, it seemed to be underground. Today, we all know where conspiracy theory comes from. We all know we, we can gather all that information from mainstream outlets, news outlets. Um, so, um, so yeah, so today all of this is very mainstream. It's in the open with a government and a president that validates, uh, validates also the response, the violent response to the to the to those theories. Uh, loss of freedom, uh, we, uh, you know, lo loss of individual freedom. You know, violence can be justified. Um, uh, the, the people thinking that through, you know, these elections, you know, are about, you know, uh, about taking everything away from them. Uh, communism, communism will take over the, the place. We must, a call to arm, the call to arm is today mainstream. It's something that we hear uh, on TV 24-7. Uh, so I, am I concerned? Yes. Meaning, I don't know if concern is, is the right word. Am I uh, do I believe that this is where we're headed? Yes, I do. This wouldn't be the first time in history. I mean, in Italy, I think there's violence, eruption of violence uh, now because of the lockdown. So um, America is headed that way, but has, it, has America really been different? And that's really what I was trying to say with my film. Not necessarily trying to say, but I wanted to bring to the table, the debate, to the round table, that six years ago, saying, look, this is what's going on now. This has been going on for a long time. America and millions of young veterans roaming in despair with no jobs, ad addicted to, to painkillers, the reason why they lose medical, uh, social security, they lose the, the healthcare. So this, this, is, this is out in the open. It just takes somebody to go there and just record it and maybe, and maybe talk about it. In, in, you know, in the news outlet. It hasn't happened. So now it might be too late. Uh, it might be too late. America is, uh, yeah, it's gotten to a tipping point. So am I concerned? <laughs> I don't know. Personally, I don't know. Um, I do, I, I believe that this is where we headed. Yeah. It's, uh, for me, it's more matter of fact. It's more, at this point, it's not, for me, it's not the beginning of this train of the, this, this thing. This is the end. I've been thinking about it. I've been observing it for a long time. So I've been concerned for a while. And, and the, this thing, this past, you know, was nobody cared. So yeah, you know, we deal with it. It's one week and we will know more. <laughs> but yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. We will, we will see the last, the third uh, extract from the last film you did. Uh, 
uh, what we're going to do when the world is on fire. We shortly talk about at uh, the beginning, and then we will open the floor for discussion. So please uh, uh, show us the third excerpt. I don't hear no dog barking. I hear the dog barking. All right, come on. That house vacant. So these cowards gonna mark niggers on the elementary school sign across the street where they put the swastika sticker and coon and KKK. And the fucking police gonna have nothing to say this is some kids. Even the Klan let you know it was KKK because they put KKK. The same day that Jeremy Jackson was decapitated. This is some bullshit. About what's going on here? How you doing, sir? Black How you power. Doing, Black power, brother. Police came and you know, like you said, they don't want you to talk. But they hey. don't. They didn't do nothing. They just gave us a card and went on. That was it. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's a mess. It's a, it's a big mess. And now I'm stuck with trying to get everything handled and showing you know how they is. That goes on what they going to give and that's it. Right. So they they told me yeah. all the vehicles, so now I got stole all over again. So on the way over here, the when we left, we found where the body was burnt at. Right. Uh -huh. There's nothing but the damn Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. Right. But then we know it's the clan. Wanna, right. And then they truly. That's why we're doing our own investigation. We on, and they try and act like it's. Today it's about somebody in New, I want to say they in New York somewhere. They called them the same way. Same way. Same stuff. Well, uh, they are very aggressive out here, clearly. Yeah. Um, And they trying to basically intimidate the people. Yeah. This is clan. Yeah. And then imagine how they try to explain this to the children, what all this is. I don't even know how to, first of all, break this down to them. They ask every day, Mama, what's KK? If it was just for me, I'm very sure they wouldn't took our time to get to school. Well, that's the thing about the Ku Klux Klan in the past. They would target the strong man to intimidate the not strong man. You a deacon in the church. You have a family. You got money. You got houses. So they do this to you with somebody that don't have money. Don't stand a chance. But see right here, they got the little symbol. Oh, yeah. Right there. Oh, they put the swatch of symbol in the Right. Tree. Well, I'm glad y'all strong people. Sorry this happened to y'all. Hey, right. little man, don't be scared of no KKK. <laughs> y'all got the Black Panthers. Right. Black yeah. Power. Yeah. Black yeah. Power. Yeah. Black yeah. Power. Black yeah. Power. I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give it to you, and you give it back to me. Come on, come on. And do it again, Let me see. Let me see. I gotta come through. Yeah. There we go. I got it now. Yep. Yeah, pull it. Come I on. keep go, doing go it. Go again. Yeah. Go again. Go again. I said I was about I'm, I'm gonna try them little bitty ones after this. What I need? I got like this for you. So we riding to take our city back from all the violence and, and crime and gentrification and all that, you know. When I ride in my neighborhood or I'm riding on my bike, I'm riding in my car. I don't know half of the people in my neighborhood or nothing, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, um, everything is being, you know, gentrified now, you know, and we're being kicked out, you know, because, you know, we can't afford renting our own neighborhoods that, that we grew up in. So we lighted up with our bicycles. 
you know, letting them know that, that we're not afraid, you know what I'm saying? And we'll ride, you know, I, I, I'll ride for what's ever mine, you know, because, you know, I, I grew up in the hood, too. So, so with the bikes and with, with the lighting up the city, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of unity, you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like these people standing for something. And do like you said, ride our bikes and ride for the cause and show them that we're not afraid. Yeah. But it, it's gonna take more than us, you know? Our group is pretty large, but it's pretty small as well. So if we get another 30, 40, 50 more people that feel the same way we feel, maybe we can make a change. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I say so. I think it's time now to take it to the street and, you know, let's ride for our city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we ride the bikes and we take our time. Got old people second life. 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 Oh, that's nice. Oh, it's nice? It looks like it. Oh, we riding bikes and we done got a ride. Yeah, I don't need no company. I remember that morning when it was one. That too bad body called working. Who did we not die in that seven four? Get in that circle. Get in the circle. You don't know what you're doing now. Come on 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 now. Get out of here, boy. Get out of here. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. Let me show you how to do this, boy. Come on. Okay, don't do that. I'm going to turn that. Come on. 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 Keep going. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Boy, let me have it. Oh, let me show y'all something. Boy, watch this. Let me have it. Boy, circle with the tank. Let me have it. That's it. Now, let me have it. Let me have it. That's it. Now. That big tank hit the circle on him. You know. Come on. Come on, now. I'm jumping that circle. I'm jumping that circle. Other way with it. Other way with it. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this circle, boy. You want to see? Come on and go with me, baby. Come on and go with me, baby. Go with me, baby. Go with me, baby. Go with me, baby. We tried to hold on to it, but. We about to pack every musician in here gonna help me to pack some shit up and we gotta get up out of here. Unfortunately, but we gave all we had. Oh. We gave everything we did, we gave it all. From from the rooter to the fucking tutor. That's right. We gave it. Yeah. Yep. And we gotta get up out of here, y'all. That's alright, we ain't going no matter. And if God's willing, maybe. Yeah. Oh, do God. Oh. As I said, let's start with uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the question of uh, Czech filmmaker David Chalek. Uh, how do you create the story? Can you talk about your creative process? Do you write a script? Uh, are you using only non-actors or also actors? And maybe I can add how do you, how your style has developed? Because it's obvious that it was different eight years ago compared to now. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely different. Uh, so um, I don't write screenplays. Uh, the only time I wrote a screenplay was for, for my first film because I thought that the tool of a screenplay was the only way to, one, uh, uh, make it happen. So follow. So I have control over a story to fund a film. 
uh, but at some point, as, I, as, as the first film is about a road trip, uh, at some point I realized that all the, the people uh, and places I got to discover uh, along, uh, the, uh, along the journey were far more interesting and more uh, uh, pertinent to, to the story, to the people, to the reality that I was just telling uh, that I ditched the script. Uh, I realized that my interpretation of a priori of things meant uh, absolutely no value compared with the experience that I was having. So I stopped writing a script. Uh, I wrote an outline of, of ideas and, and scenes um, for my second film, The Low Tide, and then I stopped writing altogether. Um, that is because I started to, uh, to, to develop this this conventions, this idea that trusting the process, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, letting go control and, uh, and letting people, allowing people to tell stories, bits of stories that I would gather and collect and, and assemble was the most efficient for me, effective way and most satisfying way to, to make a film. Um, I don't, uh, so I don't, I don't write, I don't uh, hire actors. Uh, 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 projects start with an uh, idea, but not an idea for a film. An area of concern or an area of interest that I have, uh, like in the case of the last film, uh, this racial diatribe that was, uh, you know, uh, people started talking about, you know, uh, black young, you know, black people get, getting, you know, being killed, you know, by the police and, uh, and, uh, and I wanted to just go and, and explore them, talk to and talk to communities, and and uh, and that's when I get to know people, and uh, when there is a mutual interest and connection, a mutual uh, um, uh, really like affinity, when we feel that we want to, uh, you know, embark on a long journey together, which goes way beyond the making of the film. Uh, uh, it goes, it goes on forever. Um, so that's when I start thinking that maybe there's a film to make, and that's when I start thinking that maybe these people can can be the voice of my film. So that is really how the creative process starts. Uh, um, there is no acting. There is uh, the acting of the self, the performance of the self, which is not something I discover and not something I. <laughs> I theorized it is it is the great gift to a filmmaker, I think, which is the defense mechanism for which a person in front of a camera perform, performs, starts performing, strengthens the muscle of performance, which we could call a mask. Um, it's, or it's a guard in boxing terms so that, you know, um, they don't, they're not fully exposed and vulnerable to a camera. And uh, and the antidote to that for me uh, is the is the long takes. My takes last the whole length of uh, the duration of uh, you know for how long a, a memory card can can allow. Before it used to be the eleven minutes of a super sixty millimeter roll, and now it's for for the last film is the sixty minutes of a on my memory card on a on a Ari uh, um, Amira. Um, so when I, I shoot an interrupted takes and sometimes I replace the card with oscillating, just clapping hands, their guard, you know, not even, you know, a, bo a boxer cannot hold the guard up for, for 30 minutes straight. And that's the moment where the unfiltered truth emerges. And it's so, uh, raw that it resembles, uh, an acting performance. Um... So I hope that answer the question. Uh, there is another question related to what, what you are talking about, uh, uh, because as a filmmaker, you somehow need to know that there is a structure you are following, uh, that uh, the film will go at some direction. So uh, when is the moment when you can start uh, to shoot, uh, that you know the story, uh, and I remember that you said that this last thing, what we're going to do, we, you shot 150 hours. So it's maybe not only a question of uh, shooting, but editing then. So 
how you deal with structuring uh, this type of material? So, Maria Landozo, the editor of my all my films, she's a, she's a great great friend. She's a she's a wonderful person. Uh, she's a person I love and I relate to, you know, per, from a personal standpoint. Uh, we uh, we got to know, we always edited in either her house or my house, so we know each other, you know, in a way that transcends cinema, and that's and that's that's and when we care for each other, then we trust each other, and we can do no wrong. So I feel with her, you know, the freedom to you know to to shoot in a free form at times and uh, and i and i trust her to to uh, get a hold of this material and start playing with it start assembling it uh of course we communicate we talk we don't we, there's no screenplay there's only some notes we talk either personal by email so i send notes bits of what what i feel what i feel the stories are because obviously we see some stories in this case you could say there are at least you know three or four main ones or three or four main ones including the indians mm. but i feel many more so i share my thoughts with marie but uh not in a controlling way there's no hierarchy between us i tell her that we i i see a few stories and then perhaps i throw in ideas here and there uh i shoot sequences like in the beginning of the end of this uh of this new of this 2018 film with the indians and uh, the mardi gras indians the indians of the american south and um and then uh, and then i tell her that maybe we have uh, there's a meaning you know that we have an in beginning of an, 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 a, 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 um uh oh my an introduction, an epilogue. Maybe there is something there. There is something there that can open and close the film and we talk about it. And then I let her edit for a couple of months on her own. And uh, I don't review footage ever, ever. I don't review a single clip of footage while we shoot because that would, again, that will inevitably uh, will uh, allow me to have preconceived ideas of where the story is going. So gain, regain some unnecessary control of the process. So I don't, and, and give me unnecessary anxiety. So I don't review that. And uh, Marie Helene reviews it. And then when we get together, I review the footage for the first time. Although I remember it, of course, but I have a, I, re I review it for the first time when, when she replaced it with me, with her choices. So Sometimes after the shooting, not before. Oh, after she already assembled something. Mm -hmm. I don't review anything during the shoot or after the shoot ever. Uh, I don't have to repeat anyway the shots. I don't have to base my repetition on mistakes. I don't look for, I don't see things in terms of mistakes or not. Uh, I don't, I've had scratch um, negative, I've had uh, unrecorded or deleted cards. I don't even want to know, I never knew which part was scratch, which part was deleted. Uh, it, does, it has no importance to me because in the end, you know, it's an experience and we gather some footage and that's what the film will, will, will reflect that footage and that's it. So that's all there is for me. Uh, in a way, I put myself in a position to do nothing wrong. I can never make a mistake if I see it that way. And I like it the way I live, you know, I think it, it I think it will, um, you know, it favors my longevity as a filmmaker and as a human being. So I like to work that way. Uh, yeah, and then we get together and we, and sometimes this process is very convoluted because then maybe what, I don't feel what Marie is doing and that can, you know, then we have to go back and it's, and it's laborious and at times we click. This one was, was surprisingly smooth and easy. It just flowed very easily between Marie and I. Um, and, uh, the other side was complicated was complicated, but it is not also coincident that the other side, the other side has a very strong masculine and male energy, masculine energy. There is a brute force, a physical force, whereas this one is a strong feminine energy. And, and, and I think, I, I think that also affects the relationship, the way we relate to the film between me and Maria Len. you know, we all have our own energy and, and traumas and, 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 and taboos and, and uh, prejudices. 
That's interesting, this connection with editor. Uh, she's Italian as well? Or? She's Belgian. Belgian. She's Belgian, yeah. She, mm -hmm. she's, she's Belgian. She's a, she's a wonderful person. Uh, Margot Zata is asking how you deal with your crew during the shooting and how you brief the characters, uh, uh, how that, you know, they ignore camera, uh, they or at least the parts we can see in the film are very natural. And if you have ever shot yourself in the film, or if you are thinking about it to be part, visible part of the film. I always shot, I always shoot about half of the film. Just that's, that also came because of practical reasons, because as I said, I never cut my takes. So it is physically impossible, at least for my level of strength to hold the camera for, you know, for, 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 for 30 minutes. So we pass it along to each other's shoulder, Diego and I, uh, and, and that's I, and that's why without cutting again. So that's, that's, that's why I shoot 50%. And, uh, And that works very well because uh, because it's two you know two eyes and two points of views uh, with our own sensitivities you know shooting the same moment the same the same scene. Um, uh, as far as uh, as far as the characters acknowledging the presence of a camera, I. Uh, it is very important that they acknowledge the presence of the camera. In fact, the camera is there, but I don't do anything. If in the past I was thinking that perhaps we should tone down even the technical language that we use on set, in a way we should camouflage ourselves as, as part of the, the community. Let's, uh, right now I, I actually I, I went back and, and totally ditched that um the 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 that attempt of, of mitigating the presence of this film camera or the camera apparatus no right now it, it is explicit it's overt as we camera the camera the fact that we exist with a camera the fact that the camera is always there in our filmic relationship is uh, very explicit and uh, and uh, and um and that is actually It has a dual effect, as I said, triggering one triggers the performative aspect of, you know, the performance of the self, which I said is a good, it, it is a very legit uh, mechanism, a vehicle for people to finally find the strength to, uh, to be vulnerable in front of the camera. And, um, and the other, the other effect is it, functions as a, if it fi if triggers the catharsis of a character. The camera is there to witness something that is uh, undisputable, that is raw and is true, despite the fact that then all the footage will be manipulated in the edit, uh, during the editing phase. But if films something, the camera is there to make sure that whatever happens will be, uh, will be, you know, will be <laughs> uh, passed along to other people posterity audiences the camera and that's why i think uh, people sometimes gave or gifted me and then us all of us with very powerful intimate moments because of the of the of the awareness of the fact that the camera uh will um uh, you know that the, the, the footage will always hold their the truth that part of them of them like for forever And uh, there is a certain sense of almost, uh, yeah, there is the, um, yeah, there's a sense of immortality. There's some sense of feeling safe with something that cannot be disputed. Uh, the fact that I make a statement, political statement on camera, someone with a character made a political statement on camera, uh, even the act with the Obama, the car and Obama on the other side, there is something that stays and it becomes, you know, if I had the visibility of Steven Spielberg, the world will be talking about that. And that's, and that's how, and that's, that's the magnitude of the presence of a camera. That's what a camera could do. Unfortunately, you need also, yeah, as I say, a reputation to do that. But, but in an ideal world, that's what the camera means. So I acknowledge the camera. I welcome the camera as, and therefore cinema, as the vehicle that could actually bring us places, you know, they would take us out of the dark into 
you know, out of anonymity. So sorry for the long answer, but I, I, do, I think that trying to hide the camera in the chasing some ideal that is fallacious to begin with of neutrality in documentary, of objectivity, which is a dangerous concept because there's no such thing as neutrality, as impartiality. Uh, so doing that is actually detrimental, detrimental to, to the emergence of this truth. You need a witness, you need a powerful medium for someone to feel empowered enough to tell the truth, to show you their truth. And that is the camera. Therefore, that is cinema. And that's why I do it. So there's no hiding the camera. There's a camera in your face, uh, which creates discomfort, but also creates empowerment. Mm -hmm. Did you appear also in front of your own camera? I mean, in your film? Mm, no, no, I, I did not. No, I did not. I, I did not. <laughs> never, and never, it never crossed my mind. And you know, something that uh, it's probably the first time I've been asked that, and the first time I'm answering that. So I don't know. I never thought of it. Uh, but I take it back. Now that you ask, for, my dad passed away, died of Alzheimer's two years ago. And as he was dying, he had been sick for a while. I was talking to some friends and say, should I document this? Should I? But, um, but apart from uh, apart from the pain, uh, it was perhaps the reason for not doing it was it ties into what I just answered to. I think her name was Margot Sad. I don't remember well to her question. It was just that there was no empowerment. There was no active participation for an Alzheimer, a man dying of Alzheimer's, and that was just uh, something that I don't. I'm not interested in in cinema, which was the mere information delivery, albeit visual, albeit fascinating, maybe even touching, but it's the information delivery that is the hierarchical approach, the top-down approach of me filming someone who has no clue what's happening, which is the opposite of, opposite of what's saying. Amer awareness of a camera empowers the character who has a clue of what's going on. But with an Alzheimer's patient, uh, 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 he had no clue what's going on, so I decided against it. So there, that's... Uh, that's a long answer, but the short answer is, yeah, no, I never appeared in front of a camera. Uh, and this is a finished film with your father? or I didn't shoot it. You I didn't did not. Even shoot it. Yeah. I didn't uh, Lorenzo shoot it. asks uh, about the protagonists when you're shooting them, if they can say stop. And if yes, uh, how often do they say this or uh, in which situations uh, they ask you to stop shooting? Uh, many times, uh, many times. Uh, um, sometimes it's uh, for reasons that go unexplained. Sometimes uh, and uh, several times is when uh, that vulnerability is becomes unbearable becomes a burden because too much, you know, we go in from that defense mechanism of the performance to openness. And then at some point openness becomes, uh, uh, again, a, a scary place to be for too long. And then there's shutting down. Uh, there's been several instances, uh, I don't know, Lorenzo, if you've seen any of my films, so I'm not getting into details, but for those who have seen Stop the Pounding Heart, and for those who have seen The Other Side, they, those people, they, they, they know that both films end or almost end in a similar way, in a, almost in a, conf a confession when one of the characters uh, as a revelation, you know, the, the, you know, reveals something to the other character. In the case of the other side, and I'll stop the point in art, it's the daughter telling to the mother that perhaps she's not worthy of, you know, the mercy and the love of God. In uh, the other side, there is a, a, a man who tells his fiancé his fiance that he might have to, you know, uh, go to jail uh, to, you know, get his, his life back in track. And that's the only way of surviving is going to jail. In both cases, that what came as a surprise to the other person. And in both cases, those are scenes that I recorded alone uh, in total silence for a long time. Um, one lasted 27 minutes, the other one lasted more than an hour. And in both cases, he stopped because the character asked me. In both cases, it's tears. And that was a moment when they tell me to stop because that vulnerability becomes unbearable. 
um, coincidentally in both films, those are the two. That's when I decided to stop shooting the film altogether. That is also a coincidence, but it's also to say that I'm also aware, I'm trying to be aware of when the care this is too much for the care. Sometimes I know they want to stop and they're not able to do it, maybe because of a sense of duty. So as I said before, my main role, my main duty on a film is to hold a safe space for them. Uh, I, I take all responsibility for that. So I have the utmost level of concentration on them and I act to gauge based on experience that I have as a filmmaker and as a middle-aged man at this point. And uh, the utmost attention and, and uh, in understanding if that's the time to stop. So when not only do I allow them to say stop, but also sometimes I stop because I feel that there's a need to stop. Uh, there's many, many instances of that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Igor is asking, why did you decide to make the last film as a black, black and white film? Um, for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, I had decided bef before starting to shoot, so it's a, it's a, it's a decision that came before. Um, one of the reasons is, since I, I went there to Louisiana, I traveled to Louisiana with the idea of making a film about uh, black music, African music and African-American music. Uh, and then things developed. It became the characters themselves. So they, they brought the story back to the present time. It's like, this is my, what might interest you. You might feel the need as a white European man to go and gather from our roots, whereas we want you to listen to what's happening today. This is what we need. That's what you need. And, and, that, so, and that was it. So I decided that the story to tell was the story of today. And, um, and the story was highly political. Um, and, and that's when I thought that the story, perhaps black and white would help me to tie this story or that, that moment, historical moment into another on, onto another historical moment of the civil rights movement where all the iconography is in black and white. So I thought that it would be good to have this uh, debate, even all this aesthetic lens with, between a moment that I thought would be the beginning of a new civil rights movement. Again, this is shot 2017. Today, we perhaps see that there is another civil rights movement uh, that is born. But I, three years ago, I was witnessing what I gauged that this could become something you know, like a new civil rights movement. So I wanted to tie that into the past. There is another answer, but uh, I'll try to be quick. It's all about, I felt, I didn't want to shoot in color because it created kind of a hierarchy of beauty, you know, among the groups that I was filming. You know, think the Black Panthers, you know, hanging out in places that are, you know, sometimes empty, gray, empty rooms, highway underpasses. And think about the Indians wear these beautiful, beautifully colored dresses. I didn't want to create a hierarchy in terms of beauty. And beauty makes us connect and empathize with characters. So I didn't want to create the hierarchy and a hierarchy that is also based on color, which is which induces an idea of beauty that is all European, white European. It comes from pictorial. Uh, art so uh, I felt that was ethically wrong so I let go of color thank you uh, Radek is asking uh, that he feels that there are so many details in your film and uh, shaky movement like the cinematic style is this kind of vibrant style uh, is it because of invisible emotional dynamics of your characters or why you are using this kind of uh, cinematography out of necessity, uh, as I said, uh, my methodology or my method is, uh, is, uh, is, is developed um, in a way that it could best serve the characters and the story. So um, it, it, since, as I said, I, I, I shoot those long takes and that allows characters to kind of, you know, be at ease and accept the camera into this circle of trust. Um, and the truth to emerge. So at the same time, I need maximum flexibility. So it's not only handle camera, but it's also one lens. Um, 
in uh, it's 32 millimeter, so slightly wide. Uh, it's one camera, one lens for portability and, and, and this way, dynamic way of shooting. Uh, the, uh, I need to be reactive to what's happening and I need to be agile. And so uh, my, the, the aesthetics and the aesthetics, so, so the, the, the method, the shooting approach is actually at service of it's just because it's, it optimizes, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this approach, which is, uh, um, based on, you know, com where, that, where I have little control of what's happening and, uh, in terms of, you know, how long we will shoot, so time and place, um, so this approach is the, it's what works the best for me. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Lukash is asking, and I think this uh, question came when we were talking about the other side and low tide, that probably most of your heroes are voters of Trump. And if uh, you are able to discuss uh, political issues with them, and if you feel comfortable. We discuss, well, I mean, uh, right now, you know, um, Right now we, we talk about it. Uh, right now we talk about it as uh, you know, although they're not the characters of any of my you know my films anymore because I'm in touch with other people. My film, um, we talk about it, uh, not to the but 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 it's a different way of talking about it. Okay, it's 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 not like we would talk about it in Italy, which is uh, in new <laughs> statements. It's a meat statement. So there is a demarcation line where we feel safe. We don't have fear. We don't fear, and therefore we don't trigger answer. We use the I statement. We don't use the you statement. So we talk about it, and um, yeah, it's the conversation that, that we have. And uh, and since we handle it with I statements and we talk about ourselves, we like to listen to each other's perspective. Sometimes we find. Uh, Point of convergence. It's not about just voting for Trump. It's the end result of something very complex and uh, of a of a of a journey of you know of uh, each individual that is is very complex. And that's what I'm interested in. Not in the end result. Voting for Trump or voting for Biden is just it's just a subproduct or a lot of something that is much deeper than that. So we're talking about, you know, why it is important to defend the second amendment of the constitution, the right to bear arms and why it's important to not to limit uh, gun rights. It interests me way more than, you know, the, 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 the final, you know, the, again, the, the end result, which is who we're voting for. Uh, as I said before, you know, I can't, if I want to, talk about somebody who votes for Trump, if I want to talk about Trump voters, then I need to, I need to have enough experience so that I can, I, I have to have enough knowledge of the backstory or everything that leads to that. I, I can't just make um, my own, you know, um, um, suppositions. Uh, the world, you know, I don't like to do it that way. I don't like to do things that way. I, I don't want to dismiss anybody. I start from the, from the idea that everybody has valid reasons, inherited or experienced uh, reasons for which they do what they do, they act the way they act. And uh, there is something that in, in psychiatry and psychoanalysis is very well laid out for everybody, right? There is, uh, there's always, if we talk in terms of trauma, there's always, you can always go back and find the reason for that trauma. So and I, you know, there's always something for which, and in that something, in that core essence, we can all relate. And this is not a populist mess. This is not, this is actually the truth. This is the work that seems like a lot of people don't want to do anymore. So answer again, long answer for some, yes, we do talk about it, but we're more interested in talking about the whys, how we got there, how we got where we got. We don't want to shut each other down. That is creating the divide that I, it's so uncomfortable to live here in the front line in Texas that I, I don't want to be any part of this divide. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are very sensitive for current issues, what we can see, because making film takes years, but then your films are really about issues of the day, uh, very much connected. So uh, what is your next film will be? What is in the center of your attention at the moment? I don't exactly know, because I continue to work on projects and then I ditch them. Um, I don't know exactly. 
all I can say is that I'm talking to all the people I know. I was with uh, some of the people that we seen the other side uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, which I uh, was uh, having lunch with uh, Judy and our families. Uh, Judy is the woman from What You're Gonna Do When the World's On Fire. And we are always talking and see if we can, I don't know with whom, but if there's something, that if we can, you know, go back to, you know, spending time together and telling other stories. How? I don't know yet. Otherwise, I would tell you, but I don't know yet. But um, for me, for every project, there is there is something that I consider is, uh, um, do I want to... Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if I want to tell a story that is that is uh, of the past. And that will catapult my work into the realm of fiction. And uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think about that. Would I be able to use, instead of, you know, would I be able to tell a story of the past? Since I talk about always oh, the roots of American culture, and I just talked about, you know, what led us to today. So I've been also reading a lot reading a lot about America of the 19th century. Instead of reading the news right now, I'm reading about America of the 19th century, Manifest Destiny, American exceptionalism, all those theories and all those philosophies that are still at the foundation of the political thought, the right-wing political thought today. So sometimes I'm thinking maybe I should go back to the past and tell stories of America of, uh, I don't know, 100 plus years ago. So, but I don't know. I don't know. Like Martin Scorsese and other filmmakers. Yeah. In a way, it's interesting. It. But but uh, actually, let's say that we are at the very end. Uh, and I have a last question. Uh, and I want to thank you very much for these uh, two hours we are having together. And I have to say that everybody who came up at the beginning is staying with us till the end. So it has to be really uh, like... Uh, big event for everybody, not only for me, to sharing the time with you. And thank you very much. And I would like to ask uh, Margaret Dira, uh, the writer, once said, I will not do nothing to save the world. Uh, I don't think that this is your case, but uh, sometimes it's not easy to find the light in films you made or the beauty what is the beauty for you in films you did? Hmm. Um, I think the most beautiful thing I have achieved is that I have, uh, I have, uh, I have, a, I, I, I have, a, I, I've, I've come out of every, every film, every film process, uh, fully enriched and changed, and I have. Uh, stolen or have been given i gather so much from the people i've you know uh, that have made me like a, a better man but i don't want to say a better man is necessarily a good man a better man just means a man who is uh, less self-centered less convinced of my own preconceived ideas that uh, a man that is i have less less scared of uh, of ditching or discarding all my previous background knowledge, the, a lot of it which came from books. And uh, instead, you know, uh, <clears throat> a man who started questioning, you know, I started questioning myself and my own values. So I, I'm a father of mixed race kids. I live in Texas. Um, you know, I have friends who have a very rich and a friends who have absolutely nothing and all of that. But again, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about sharing a lot of situations that I, and it's not because I'm special, just because I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that these people are just, uh, uh, trusted me or learned to trust me or decided to just open the doors to me. And, uh, I think it's the, so I have an incredible sense of, uh, fulfillment and, uh, and then the fact that all of that is translated into cinema and a career and credibility that I'm credible and I've been validated as a spokesperson, uh, as I'm doing now, I've been doing for two hours with uh, mainly, I assume, people from the Czech Republic. And this is, this is something, yeah, that's very humbling. It's very special. 
uh, as a atheist uh, middle-aged man, you know, for me, this is the antidote to, you know, to fear of death. If things continue this way, that I have access to other people's lives and I can get to talk to people and be taken seriously, man, maybe death is not that scary. I can relax and say, man, this is awesome. So that's that. Great, Roberto. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for being with us. It was Roberto Minervini at the Hlava 2020 online edition. Thank you and let's meet in better times in physical in Hlava. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who shared time with us and keep, keep, keep in touch. No, I Good will. Night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Ciao. Good night. Ciao, ciao.